Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank Perry Hoffman uh, for inviting me here and, of course, for her strenuous work uh, to help these patients and their families uh, across 10 years. We should celebrate that. I also want to say um, Happy Mother's Day to all of you for whom that applies. <laughs> I think uh, the mothers of our country are helping, uh, helping our civilization survive. And without that, I'm not sure we would. Uh, it's, a, it's a distinct advantage and disadvantage to talk after all those wonderful talks this morning. And my temptation is to throw away my talk and try to get into a dialogue with each one of those speakers. I would rather do that. But that's not what I've been asked to do, so I'll try not to do that. And my task is equally difficult because at this point, uh, because of the food you have ingested, the blood is going to your stomach. And it's, uh, I've been told by Emily it's my job to keep you awake. So I will try to do that. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of jokes. I was impressed by uh, the speakers this morning, the amount of humor wonderful humor, and uh, I don't have very many jokes, and that's not a joke. <laughs> okay. But I, I, wanna, I do want to relate somewhat to the speakers before me and then see if I can tie them into what I had prepared. First of all, I found Stacy's talk uh, extremely moving and enlightening. I think she's still out signing books. Um, I just want to pick up on a few themes that strike me as quite relevant to all of us who try to be uh, therapists or coaches or whatever to borderline uh, individuals. She said, my skin is my barrier. And indeed, I think probably the central core of this disorder is a hypersensitivity to other people and difficulty understanding self and others in the relationships with other. So the skin, the shield to protection, that's all extremely important. She said, be slow to pathologize differences among people. I'm going to talk about that today in terms of where the National Institute of Mental Health is going in terms of research from now on. Research now on is going to focus not so much on borderline as a category, but borderline as different domains of dysfunction. And these domains of dysfunction are seen as cutting across all of us. So that's one of the reasons I think that Charlie Swenson applied, he said DBT is being applied to this disorder, this disorder, this disorder. In part, that's because the domains of dysfunction cut across those categories in DSM-4. DSM-5 has a different orientation. We will find out with time whether it's a better one, but it is different. Stacy also talked about her attempts to connect to a boyfriend and several men. And I think that connection to others, especially in a heterosexual, homosexual, in a sexual romantic relationship, is extremely important in borderline patients. It, actually, it's important across all of us. And I'm amazed that there isn't more attention paid to that, at least overt attention. And the other one that I think Stacy uh, uh, hinted at was the timing of the treatment that she received in the course of her young life. So at what point in the domain dysfunction did she meet certain people? So that raises two extremely important points. The whole phasing of the disorder and how it unfolds, and therapist differences. 
Believe me, I'm a fan of DBT. I'm probably, oddly enough, uh, I've probably known Marsha Linehan longer than even Charlie Swenson. Uh, Marsha and I both grew up <laughs> in the streets of Oklahoma, and our parents knew each other, and Marsha wrote an article for me way before she was known for DBT. Um, at that point, she was studying depression and suicidal behavior in the context of depression. So I've known her a long time. So I thought, Stacy, I, I can't, many things that I'm going to try to talk about in a somewhat abstract, academic way, I think Stacy has said much better. Secondly, I want to tell you I had a wonderful experience this week in New York City at the American Psychiatric Association annual meeting. I was on a panel organized by John Oldham. And on the panel were Peter Fonagy, the uh, father, if you will, of MBT, which Lois is going to talk about this afternoon. Martin Bohus, the face of DBT across Germany and the European world. John Gunderson, who was one of the first people to look at, way before DSM-3, to look at criteria to then articulate um, a diagnosis for this disorder. Myself, and then a discussant, Antonia New, who's a brilliant uh, neuroscientist uh, at Mount Sinai. And I think the panel suggests a potential direction of where we're going in the next 10 years. There seem to be enthusiasm, but some sobering thoughts. The sobering thought is that all the, there's a lot of treatments now that work, including, of course, DBT that has the most data with it. But when you really get down to it, it's hard to see that one treatment is really that much better than another. In each treatment, there are people who respond, and there are people who don't. And so, and in each treatment, as I'm going to try to describe for you, some domains of function change, especially the ones that you've heard about this morning, and some domains do not. And so we, we've come a long way in 10 years, but we have an awful long way to go. So Fonagy talked about the multifaceted aspects of mentalization. So all the ins and outs of what it means for a normal person, whatever that is, to process perceiving another person, understanding another person, responding to another person, and back to a feedback loop in the interaction sequence. Martin Bohus, and I, just a, a thought to you all, Martin Bohus and some of his brilliant colleagues um, have a multi-site center grant in Heidelberg and Mannheim. They have several million euros, not dollars, euros, to study all the aspects, cognitive, neuroscience, uh, um, et, et cetera, all the aspects of borderline personality disorder. And I think, sadly enough, as NIMH's money goes down, I think we're going to be superseded in the world seen by research centers like this. But at least that will profit us in our future. And Antonia New, who talked about um, the centrality in her mind of this hypersensitivity in interaction with other people, and how do we target treatments to that center. So then to take a page out of Dr. Sledge's uh, opening comments, even though it's after your lunch, I'm trying to keep you awake. Um, but I'm also trying to do something else. I'm trying to introduce you to maybe a somewhat different way 
of thinking about borderline personality disorder. Not totally different from DBT, but maybe slightly different, which then might lead to some treatment differences. And as Dr. Slade said, not just openness to others' points of view, but how do you connect them? And I'd like you to think about how you connect what I'm going to say that has to do with a theory of personality functioning and then object relations theory, how you could approach that in relationship to what Lois is going to talk about next, which is uh, attachment theory, I think one of the most powerful theories we have about human functioning. So with that as an introduction, also let me add that uh, um, I'm sort of agnostic about the best treatment. Uh, I'm not sure that's the best question, really. I think the best question is, what's the best treatment for this particular individual at this particular individual's time in the progression of what's going on? And then, of course, you've got these tremendous therapist differences. So uh, there, there's a lot of variables in this process. So if time allows, I'll talk about the essentials of what we call transference-focused psychotherapy. What's the theoretical basis of it? What is the current context of treatment development, which I've already uh, implicate, uh, talked to you about? And then there's the powerful implications of the National Institute of Mental Health, what they call the RDOX initiative, the Research Domain Initiative. So in other words, I'm sorry, that's probably a strange word. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Um, the idea being that a lot of these disorders, as Charlie Swenson talked about, have common neurobiological, psychological, behavioral dimensions across the disorders. And so treatment, at least research, will begin to focus on those domains, not so much on the disorders. Okay. As I said, what is the best treatment for this particular borderline? I, I think that's not, as I've said, not a very good question. I think how can one shape a tailored treatment to a specific patient with severe personality disorder? By the way, I have never found a borderline personality disorder patient who only has borderline personality disorder. That's one of the first things you should think about, that all these individuals have a range of axis one, axis two, and so that's the reason the research domain orientation might be helpful to us. So I'm not going to talk very much about TFP. I think if you want further information about it, uh, you can contact us. And I don't want to spend my time on that per se. Just that uh, <laughs> I would say this, that any implication that Charlie Swenson gave you that TFP would be like his analyst is totally wrong, <laughs> totally wrong. Um, uh, his analyst, um, I'm happy for Charlie. I've never had psychoanalysis, and <laughs> I guess Charlie has profited from it. I think that our treatment, <laughs> I for one have not. Uh, um, um, and, and when I go home tonight, you know, I don't have any jokes, but I will, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to imagine Charlie running like a goose. I, 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 Charlie, you're incredible. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I just want you to know that there's many treatments for borderline now, and they share a lot of common elements. They all have clarity about the pathology. They have a clear rationale for treatment approach for their treatment approach. They structure the treatment process. That seems to be, across studies, a very, very important phenomenon, which seems obvious, but it's not so obvious. There's the presence of a consistent, you know, dogged therapist who won't give up. And there's a focus in all these treatments on the here and now. One myth might be that the analyst would talk only about your past. TFP and all these treatments focuses on the here and now. And all of these treatments in their own way develop an expectation for change. 
things can get better. You stick with it, things can get better. What's unique about TFP is that the goal is change beyond symptom change, including, and I'll talk a little bit about this, the reappraisal, the reassessment of your internal representations of yourself and other people. We think that's a driving force in human nature. Of course, reduced aggression and impulsivity in social relations, and very much important, we think, and here's where the field is lacking, a, an improvement in work and intimate relationships. I think to generalize, I'll try to give you some data on it, our treatments are very good at reducing symptoms, reducing cutting, uh, you know, suicidal behavior, reducing affect dysregulation, but many of these patients continue not to work, and many of these patients continue to have serious difficulty in their, especially their intimate and friendship relationships. So I'm trying to indicate where I think when Perry Hoffman calls us all together 10 years from now, I hope I'm still around, um, where I hope the field can go next. I'm going to skip that. I don't think, th this is just some of our randomized clinical trials. There's no doubt that DBT has more randomized clinical trials than anybody. It's extremely impressive. And I don't want to be the one that uh, rains on the parade, but I must tell you, the, I think there's a growing number of people that are dissatisfied with the money and the yield from randomized clinical trials. There's many uncontrolled variables, and it so far has not led us to understand how the treatments affect the changes that they really affect. We, we have an awful lot of work to do. This is one of our attempts to show that while transference-focused psychotherapy does reduce symptoms, it tries to address the question of how does it reduce, question, uh, reduce symptoms. And we think it operates through mentalization, which you're going to hear more clearly about from Lois next. And we used a particular method, an AAI method, to try to show that the ability of the borderline patient after a year in TFP improved their ability to reflect on themselves and other people in a meaningful way in their relationships. This is just the data. I don't want to dwell on that. So what's the, um, what's the theoretical basis uh, behind a TFP? And not being an analyst, and for many reasons, I'm not going to talk psychoanalytic jargon. I'm going to try to normalize some of the thinking for you. And, and first, I'm going to point out something that uh, is kind of amazing, I think. Ever since DSM-3 in 1980, we've had the benefits of having personality disorder in the diagnostic system. And that's been very helpful. It's allowed us to use criteria to select samples and to investigate. It's been very helpful. But it's a funny thing. The American Psychiatric Association has gone through three or four iterations, including now, without once mentioning any kind of theory of normal personality functioning. Isn't that strange when you think about it? So what, how does the normal person, again, whatever normal means, how does that person function especially in interpersonal relationships, in a smooth, flexible way. It seems to me all of our treatments ought to take a look at that to then begin to figure out how the deviations occur in the developmental pathway and how we might pull those deviations back to a normal path. Now, the best personality functioning theory I know of is that of Michelle and Shoda. You have these slides in your booklet, so I'm not sure I'm I have time to go over them in detail, 
But let me just tell you about Walter Mischel, very interesting man, Columbia University psychology professor. And for many years, he did not believe that people have a personality. Actually, when I first met Marsha Linehan, Marsha sort of said to me, John, I'm not sure people have a personality. I'm concerned about suicidal behavior, which, as we see, has certainly paid off. Walter Michel also said, I'm not sure people have a personality, because if you look at them in different situations, they behave differently. So in some situations, people are honest. So if they go into a supermarket, they don't steal laxatives, like some patients I know. And then when they go to pay their taxes, they're not so honest about it. So is there really an honesty trait across different situations? So Michelle said, I'm not sure there is such a thing as personality. And then to fast forward some 25, 30 years later, Michelle does feel or does think that there's personality at this point, but it has some wrinkles in it. And one of the wrinkles, and I think it's very relevant to borderline personality disorder, is that any clinician knows that under certain conditions, people with that diagnosis behave just like everybody else, at least from an outward behavioral point of view. Under other situations, they do not. So one of the tasks of our assessment is to find out in which situations they have difficulties and which ones they do not. So, what, so Michelle talks about human functioning in terms of the signature of the person in terms of if-then situations. If this occurs, this person will behave this way. So he has found out that if you track people across time and situations, across situations they behave differently, but in the situation they behave very consistently over time. So it means that we have to get beyond just talking about emotional dysregulation. Our borderline patients are not emotionally dysregulated at every point in their path. They have emotional dysregulation, usually in certain specific contexts. And of course, that's where skill training can be quite powerful if, of course, the skill training relates to the specific skills in those specific situations. So I'll just... So this graphic sort of, sort of gives you a story about that. And what, what he's saying is that the environmental situation stimulates what he has called cognitive affective units. So when you walk into this uh, auditorium and you see somebody that you know or don't know, it stimulates a cognitive combined with an affective response in your head. And he says that these cognitive affective units are organized, that they guide your behavioral ex uh, expressions. These are then observed by other people, and they feed back to a loop that comes back again. And of course, Stacy articulated those kind of feedback loops with her parents, with her boyfriends, much, much, much better than I could ever do. So TFP then, and if you think about this, this is very much like what's called an object relations theory in a psychoanalytic orientation. And it suggests to me that any, what, any adequate treatment of personality disorder, including borderline personality disorder, must assess this, 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 and this, and the feedback loop. And it was sort of implied, I think, by Charlie Swenson, it's where in that feedback loop can you begin to um, effectively intervene. 
Notice this is a psychological theory. So it assumes all kinds of biological, biosocial predispositions, genetic, biochemical, somatic, and so forth. Now, of course, that assumption is going to be carried forward and to the foreground in the RDOX initiative of NIMH. So I would suggest that any substantive model, you're going to hear about object relations theory and CAPS theory here. Lois will talk to you about attachment theory. Any theory worth its salt would talk about the foundations of the model, the structural features of the model, some taxonomy to help guide your assessment, and uh, intervention strategies. So I think what's its virtue and its difficulties is that object relations theory grew out of uh, psychoanalytic work. It's based on um, many, many sessions with very disturbed personality disorder people. That's both its benefit. I think it's got to be furthered by laboratory tests of these functions. And of course, it assumes then the validity, if you will, of the patient reports. So object relations theory, in short, the term object refers to a person with whom the subject has a relationship. Object relations is the quality of the subject's relationships with others. An internal object is a representation of another within the mind of the subject. So here's the heart of the thing. And this sounds an awful lot like cognitive affective units that Michelle and Shota talk about. So it, it presupposes an internal representation of yourself, an internal representation of other people, and related affects. And so this, I'm just going to leave it at this, this therapy then focuses on that particular phenomena. That particular phenomena as it gets played out in the current relationships with the patient and other significant people, especially intimate others like boyfriends, husbands, and so forth, and in the relationship that evolves with the therapist. And of course, the goal is to help the individual grow in their understanding of what's going on in themselves and with other people. In this regard, it is very, very similar, I believe, to uh, MBT. I'm going to... This uh, didn't come out very well, but I just want to make the point that uh, Kernberg, I think, in some ways, um, predates the RDOX, which you're going to see more about coming out of NIMH. Predates it in the sense that he's often talked about uh, categories. So there are categories here, like uh, hypomanic personality, narcissistic personality, borderline personality. But these are seen in a multi-dimensional space. So in other words, it does not assume that all people with the borderline diagnosis are the same. And in his way of thinking about it, and we do have data on this, these people vary in terms of some key variables. One variable is going from ex uh, introversion to extroversion. So some of us are very externally oriented toward people, toward our environment, and some of us are very removed, almost temperamentally, to avoid to stay apart. And you see that in the personality disorders with paranoid over here and narcissistic and histrionic over here. You also see levels as you go down. So in this theory, as you go down, you have more serious lack of identity, lack of a sense, a clear sense of self and other people. 
you have more primitive ways of defending self, and you have poor relationships with other people. And as you go down, aggression tends to increase. And in fact, as you come down beyond borderline to antisocial and what's called, in a bad way, malignant narcissism, the whole issue of moral values begins to be corrupted. So uh, there's a big difference between a borderline person who's also antisocial, who does not have a clear value system, uh, who goes against all structure and values, and one who does not. Okay. So what it means, and just very briefly in this theory, is that <clears throat> it's focused, this treatment is focused on real-time functioning and observation. So there's the relationship between the patient and the therapist, and this can be either hot or cool. It could be conflicted or not conflicted. And the therapist has a dual role of being both a participant and observer enough to help articulate with the patient different points of view of what's going on. My suspicion, if we got into a discussion, would be that Charlie and others could point out exactly how this process is also done in DBT, but in somewhat different ways. Now, it's called transference-focused psychotherapy because there is an assumption of transference. So there is an assumption that these, shall we call them cognitive affective units, with a perception of self and other and related affect, there's an assumption that these will be played out in the room with the therapist and will be played out in the real world with relationships that make a lot of difference to the borderline individual. I wouldn't assume, given the CAPS theory, I wouldn't assume that the transference in the room is exactly the same as relationships outside. They may or may not be. But I will assume that those are going on in the current scene, and they are a large part of what's disturbing the patient's world. And then, of course, the idea being that these self Self, S, self, and object, other, O, are transferred onto the therapist. So the therapist can both stay calm, hopefully, and be observant. I'm going to skip some of these. OK. So then what, what do I think we know after 10, 12, when did Marcia start? 19, what, Charlie, 19? 80? 91. Yeah, OK. What, what do we know since then? I think we know a lot that we didn't know then. First of all, there are many treatments for borderline personality disorder. <clears throat> and the number of treatments grows every day. I think the latest one that I'm very impressed with is general psychiatric management. Uh, John Gunderson is developing that and suggests that uh, good general psychiatric management following certain kinds of principles is probably just as good as any of the specialized treatments. But keep in mind, as I told you, not every patient responds to the treatment. So it may be that some patients who don't respond to general psychiatric uh, management may need one of these more specialized treatments. Also, what do we know? We know that treatment effects on social functioning are generally poor. And while we know that all these treatments work at a symptom level, it's not totally clear why and how they work. There's multiple meta-analyses out there, and they show exactly what I'm saying, that it's hard to find in a consistent way any one treatment that's really that much better than the others. So consider, for example, 
Shelley McMain's 2012 study, where she compared DBT to general psychiatric management. So at the end of one year of treatment, the treatment effects were the same. After two years, the effects on symptoms were pretty much the same. But here's what I want to bring your attention to, and this was a carefully carried out and designed study. But here's the important thing. At follow-up, 51% were not working nor in school, changed from 60% before one year of treatment. Before treatment, 40% were on disability, and at the end of treatment, 39% on disability. So what does that mean? Don't be negative about that. I think that we have come a long ways in 10 years. We're very good at structuring treatment, at reducing symptoms, reducing suicidal behavior. I don't think we're as good. I don't think we've given enough attention to what I'll call love and work. Now, Mary Zanarini has followed these patients for 16 years. Lois has probably been part of that team. And it's, it's powerful work because, you know, we don't want to know just what goes on cross-sexually. We want to know what goes on across time. And here's my take-home point, that symptom remission is more common in borderline than social and functional recovery, as I've said, and only 40% of the patients compared to 75% of access to disordered patients other than borderline attain social and functional recovery lasting eight years. And here's the punchline. Vocational impairment is the main reason that borderline patients fail to attain or maintain symptomatic and social vocational functioning. Back to Stacy. Did you notice how, where is Stacy? She's still signing books. She's smart. Um, <laughs> I told her after I, she gave me permission to talk about her talk, but I wanted to check with her later to see if I had distorted it. Now I guess I'm going to tell her I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, did you, did you notice Stacy's determination to get education, to get out of town, to get a profession, to get some, some skills, some learning, some, some vocational place in the world. I found that extremely impressive. So here's our docs. And here's where I think our research, at least in the United States, probably not in Germany, is going to be heavily focused on. They're going to ask us to talk about borderlines in terms of domains of dysfunction, and then they're going to require us to measure these domains across biological, psychological, and behavioral realms. I do not agree with the assumption of this. I don't, know, I don't think Stacy would either. That the RDOC classification rests on three assumptions. One, mental disorders are disorders of brain circus. That, my friends, is reductionism. <laughs> if you're a taxpayer, you are paying for the application of reductionism. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> disorders of brain circuits that can be identified with tools of neuroscience and data will yield biosignatures for clinical management. We will see. I'm not sure. Um, so here are the domains that NIMH talks about. Negative valence systems, positive valence systems, cognitive systems, and systems for social processes. And of course, when you apply that to borderline patients, you can think of predominance of negative affect, relative absence of positive affect, and variable effort for control. Variable ability to modulate and control attention on the way to affect regulation. And of course, insecure attachments to others distorted representations of self and others. So then if you apply that to our existing treatments, and I, I don't pretend to do justice to all these treatments, we don't have time, but if you think of 
the columns going down. TFP tries to approach negative valence by exploring distortions and representations of self and others, cognitive systems by reevaluation of representations, and social processes changes in the representations of self and others, and of course then behavioral change. DBT focuses on mentalizing, and DBT functions, focuses on functional analysis, skill development, mindfulness, and skill development. Now, here's my pitch. I'm sure not all of you would agree with me, but it occurs to me that we can all three stay in our silos. We can stay within our columns and just keep doing what we're doing. Right? Or we might be more creative about it, think about integration, and think about what we could do if we came across this way. What if we came across this way and used the best combination of strategies and techniques for the individual patient, depending upon the strongest domains of dysfunction in this particular patient. And I think it's worth thinking about. I have five? OK. All right. So the implications of where we're going, I think, of RDOCs is probably patient heterogeneity, what are the domains of change, and the search for biomarkers. By the way, we have research I only have five minutes. We have research showing that there are different kinds of borderline patients. We also know, so this biomarker thing, our latest study we took, we only had a short amount of money. Germany has much more. I'm very jealous. Uh, <laughs> we took 10 patients. We gave them a year of TFP. And we did an fMRI before and after to see if we can pick up changes at the cognitive, psychological level, i.e. reduce symptoms, reduce impulsivity, et cetera, and to see if the systems at the brain level are beginning to change like you would expect. And the very simple answer is, I hope soon you can read this in the literature, is that yes, when we compare post-treatment to pre-treatment, we find effective lability improvement, that is, as it goes down, it correlates with decreased amygdala activity and increased cingulate activity. So in other words, as, as the treatment helps the patient grab onto methods, skills, methods for reducing affectivity and understanding self and others, you also are getting brain changes in the brain. Somebody said, I think Emily said, that when she went to school, she was told that borderline patients do not change. I can one-up her. Uh, I went to school much earlier than Emily did, and I was told that the brain you have is the brain you have, and you have no, no ch chance, Clark, and that's the brain you have. It's not true. The brain can change, too. So I've got to get to the take-home message. We have tremendous advances. All existing treatments are limited. And I'm sure all of us are going to keep going. And I think some of the main questions are how to capture borderline heterogeneity. What are the domains of dysfunction? And maybe we can begin to investigate the various levels of the organism neurobiological, cognitive, et cetera. This is my own thoughts. Take empirically supported with a grain of salt. This is the only the beginning. As a clinician, focus on the individual patient. Each borderline is quite unique. I would say develop your own local way of matching borderline patients to treatment, <clears throat> like the one mentioned by John Gunderson. And I do think some form of integrating treatments across those rows, as opposed to just down the columns, is probably going to occur in the near future. Thank you for your attention.
Great. Um, let me just take a look at what we have here. Um, so I think uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to um, if people were interested in getting trained in transference-focused psychotherapy or learning more, um, what are some of the resources out there for people? Yeah. I'm not uh, involved in all the training. You really should contact Frank Yeomans, who is our director of training. I can give you uh, uh, email addresses and so forth if you'd like. <clears throat> What's happened, our crew is using uh, uh, the internet to do live uh, supervision uh, across the United States and Europe. And so there's different ways to get supervision when you're at your place and the supervisor is somewhere else. And we do this in multiple language. <laughs> Very good. Um, what kind of connections in the model that you presented do you see between BPD, um, PTSD, and like toxic stress? How do you think the environment is playing a role in the personality? Yes, I think the environment is playing a huge role that's the reason I said that our docs, I think, is frankly reductionistic. So it's leaving out the environment. And I tried to emphasize the environment in the CAPS theory. So clear, there's no doubt, I think, that uh, early trauma, and, and, and beyond just tr the trauma is somewhat obvious and terrible, but I think also how do ordinary households I was talking to Lois about raising her children. So how do you take a five-year-old and a one-year-old that's somewhat impulsive because the brain systems aren't fully developed for maturation, for modulation? How do you teach that? Well, most parents put that into words. They put feelings into words. They put thoughts into words. They share how I feel, how you feel, how I might feel differently, how you feel. And I think that kind of less obvious lack in the environment is operating very, very intensely in borderline backgrounds. Um, is TFP an inpatient program? Uh, no, uh, it was originally. When Charlie Swenson was at uh, the Westchester Division, uh, Frank Gilmans ran one unit, uh, and Charlie ran another, totally different uh, models. But at this point, you know, inpatient length of stay is like six days and 43 minutes. And I mean that literally. You know, the insurance company calls, uh, the patient was admitted today, and they call tomorrow and say, is the patient still suicidal? You know? So no, it's an outpatient treatment. And by and large, I think all the forms of treatment now think that probably hospitalization is not a good thing, as Charlie implied in his story, and that you want to get the patient back into outpatient treatment so that the real life experience of love and work can keep operating. We don't want therapy to become the patient's life. We want the therapy to help the patient get back into the normal environment. Great. Um, and one more. If, um, if it's, it seems that from your talk that you were saying that the effectiveness between DBT and MPT and um, TFP and general psychiatric management might all be similar. Um, why do you think it is that DBT has been so popular as Charlie was talking about earlier? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, we were talking at lunch. Um, I had lunch with a gentleman who grew up like I did in Oklahoma, where Marsha grew up. And I think, uh, we, I, I don't know if you know the phrase, dust bowl empiricism. So if you're going to survive in Oklahoma, you've got to know how to change a tire. <laughs> you've got to know how to do this to that to survive. And I think Marsha brings that kind of uh, down-to-earth practical orientation. And I think that that's, that appeals to a lot of people. I also think that the setting you work in makes a big difference. Uh, if you're in Germany, where the government, I, I don't know if you all know this, will pay for therapy two and three times a week for at least a year. Or if you live in Manhattan, where nobody, it's hard to get into a, a general clinic at all. 
like our waiting list, I was talking to uh, Stacy, the waiting list at Payne Whitney is very long. I, I think what you do and what you go for makes a big difference. And I think uh, DBT has a great appeal for, um, for applying it across these horrible settings. <laughs> OK. Well, we have time for one more. I'm going to ask. Oh, okay. um, uh, so we actually had a couple questions about, um, are there applications for, um, for individuals who are seeking uh, couples treatment um, and also uh, somewhat related, but also like applications um, of the treatment for individuals um, that uh, have different ethnic backgrounds? Huh. The, the, well, first of all, couples. I would just say there's no, quotes, manualized TFP for couples. Uh, but if you're training residents, like I do, I've told residents for many years, if you want to see transference and you don't want to wait for it to develop over time, see a couple. <laughs> because when you see a couple, and you ask them about their relationship, boy, do you see transference in action. And I, I do a lot of couples treatment. I find it very interesting. I find it, in some ways, much more <laughs> intriguing and difficult than individual treatment. Because, well, let me put it this way. If you want to know about transference and you have a couple, see the wife and ask her to describe herself and then ask her to describe her mate. And then meet her mate. And compare what she said to what you experienced. And that's, that's some level of transference. And then so you begin to think about how would you work with that with a couple in the room. And the other one, ethnic differences. Boy, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I just have a random thought. So, I think the answer is we have done TFP in North America, South America, across Europe. We have not done it in Asia. And I remember when uh, uh, they were developing the, the interview for personality disorders. The question was, in the Japanese culture, which has a totally different orientation to affect and affect regulation, would there be patients who would meet the criteria for borderline personality disorder? Because the, the thought was maybe, maybe they will not. But actually, the prevalence, the incidence and prevalence there was exactly the same as Western culture. So I kind of think there are many domains of dysfunction that cut across ethnic groups. They may get expressed in somewhat different ways. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Thank you.